Hello, this is RPTV News. My name is El Cachamillo, and today I'm at Paintbox Bistro in Regent Park, here to speak with Chris Klugman about the reopening of Paintbox Bistro. Hi, Chris. Thank Hi, you Ella. so much for speaking with me oh, today. Thank you for being here. Yeah. So I wanted to get started asking you about the initial opening of Paintbox in Regent Park and why you chose this location and community. Um, well, we opened uh, nearly eight years ago and it was at that point, there was very little that you see around here. It was a lot, a lot of construction hoarding and this building was just just recently, recently completed. Um, the reason I opened the business was as a social enterprise, as an employment social enterprise, to give support to um, people who were suffering barriers to employment, to the marginalized community that largely Regent Park was at that time. You have a partnership with Toronto Employment and Social Social Service. Is that you work with them? Um, we work with a lot of employment agencies, right. including TESS, they call it, uh, Test. Dixon okay. Hall, the Young Street Mission. Right. And uh, initially we partnered principally with Dixon Hall and TESS in order to identify our target demographic, which was right. people who needed a second chance or a leg up. Right, okay. And so how was the hiring process and like teaching people sort of how to like cook and work in the restaurant? How has that sort of been? Uh, it was a, it, it, it was a, a learning experience, learning experience. Um, and it evolved over the course of time. Initially, I hired almost exclusively people from the demographic I just mentioned. Right. And it was, difficult because it's uh, catering and restaurants are very complex yes, jobs yeah. and so and without real hands-on guidance and and role models it right. was very difficult for people to, to step up and, and do a good job at it so we evolved very quickly into a, a model whereby we hired about 50 percent people who were marginalized and 50 percent people who were industry professionals Wonderful. and had kind of a one-on-one -on -one peer mentoring thing going on and it meant that somebody could learn by example yeah that's a super effective way of learning and teaching mm. that's so wonderful yeah i feel like that's really productive that makes a lot of sense i was curious because i feel like would they have experience or not okay so they learn on the job is exactly wonderful okay um and so how did you get involved with the regent park community like did you live here before opening paint box no i was working as a a chef and a consultant and also a professor at George Brown Chef School. Right. And uh, the opportunity came to me because I had just opened a, a somewhat similar facility in Aurora called Edward Street. So it was a 160 seat bistro, an offsite catering company and a, a gourmet food store. And uh, the client, the, the one of the principals in that business, um, ha had a connection to Regent Park in that his father was friends of the president of Daniels, the development company. Yeah. And so he recommended me um, when they were looking for an operator here. Right. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's really interesting. And so you said you worked at George Brown as a teacher, as a culinary As a professor, chef? yeah. As a professor, what was that like? That seems so That was the most, most fun I've ever had in, in a job. Yeah? I really, really enjoyed it. Do you still work there or do anything I don't Brown? because I haven't been able to make the time given the complexity of yeah, this business. Of course. Well, that's really interesting. And so how many years did you teach there for? About 15. Oh, wow. Okay. But on a part-time basis initially, uh, the last couple of years I taught a full load. Amazing. Okay. Um, and so I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about like the menu of Paintbox. I know it's not open right now, but when it is open. So Paintbox guys... started off with a, uh, an a la carte menu. Um, European influenced, I would say, but also locally influenced. And we quickly moved to a more of a counter service style mm. in, the, in the restaurant itself. Um, the core, the, really the bread and butter of the business is off-site catering. And being caterers, we actually had to cook every kind of menu you can imagine. Yeah. It'd be it, you know, multi-ethnicity, sometimes buffet, sometimes house hors d'oeuvres. Um, sometimes it was a wedding where we were drawing from the culture of the people that were getting married. Right, okay. um, we did a, a Polish and Jamaican wedding. Uh, we did a Sri Lankan 
Thai wedding. Wow. That's... And th these were super fun because we had to actually, you know, pull from the bride and groom what the what the favorite foods that they wanted were and integrate them in the course of the, the menu. Wow. Okay. Do you have like a sort of favorite like culture that you like to pull from? Like for you personally, what's been the biggest? I want to say learning curve, maybe. What was like the most different culture that you've sort of cooked based around? You were saying so many interesting styles. Well, I've been really lucky to work with a lot of chefs from from all over that with a, a lot of different skill sets. Okay. Um, to me, so the most interesting thing really is to draw on to draw inspiration from a culture, from the ingredients, yeah. um, from the techniques, from the traditional dishes, but to play with them a little bit. Yeah. So to deconstruct a jerk chicken, for example. Yeah. So it doesn't look like a regular jerk chicken, but the flavors are there and the inspiration is there. That's incredible. I love that. Can you speak a little bit more about the actual like catering business and like what corporations you guys have catered to and stuff like that? Yeah. So most of our catering is large scale events. Right. Uh, done off site in, in large venues. Okay. Um, we've catered for the who's who of the corporate world. Everybody from Microsoft to they sell to General Motors to oh, okay. and you name it really. We, we've had a broad range of clientele, but there's been particular interest on the part of charities, nonprofits, um, certified B corporations, so companies that are, have an interest in, in doing social and environmental good based on our mandate as a, as a B corporation, which means that our intent is that business is to the benefit of all and it hurts none. That's so wonderful. So you mentioned earlier that sourcing locally was something important to Paintbox. Can you speak a little bit more to the importance of that? Um, I've been very interested in the local food movement for about 30 years. I was part of the group of chefs and farmers that formed the first organic farmers market in Toronto. And so gained connection with a lot of local food artisans as well as farmers. Uh, it's, it's a key element of our environmental mandate. Um, because food purchased from afar brings uh, a large environmental footprint to it. It's also a matter of supporting local community and local businesses. So local food is, has been part of my DNA as a chef always um, since long before Paintbox and was continued here. That's incredible. I love that. I love the importance of the environment as well as supporting locally. It's all benefits, really. It's so wonderful. How did you decide like what places to source from and how did you form those connections? How do you meet like farmers and such? Well, the initial organic farmers market was a good start. Right. Yeah. Um, we started doing an event annually, which is called Feast of Fields, mm -hmm. okay, which yeah, showcased yeah. the chefs mm -hmm. and the farmers and attracted a lot of attention on the part of people who are interested in local food and in in local food artisans. Um, also, chefs are a magnet for for producers mm -hmm. and vendors because they have the ability to buy large amounts of food. Right. And so quite often, it wasn't a matter of what I did, it was a matter of somebody showing up at the restaurant with wild leeks or with fiddleheads wow. or with um, you know, herb, herb sprouts or edible flowers that they'd grown. And so it's not very hard at all. It's just a matter of then making the decision that's what we're going to go with. Okay, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And so about working in Regent Park specifically, what's been sort of your favorite part about being here? Like ever since you've come here, what have you kind of enjoyed the most? My favorite part of Regent Park is the people. It's an incredible community. Right. It's uh, before the redevelopment, the revitalization, um, it was a very close knit community of, of very diverse cultures and diverse people but always with a strong sense of community. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that it was so separated from the city. This street wasn't here. When, yeah. when the Regent Park was last rebuilt in the 50s, it was built with this concept that it's gonna be cut off from the rest of the city mm -hmm. as being this park-like kind of space. And, uh, and what it did is it cut everybody off from the city. You couldn't even order a pizza in Regent Park because you didn't have a street address or a street running to your, your place there was no bank there was no grocery store um, it was kind of it was quite tragic actually in a way but it did form this real sense of, of being a, a tiny village in this large city yeah. and and that persists to this day I'm very fortunate to have a lot of friends and acquaintances who are part of the old Regent Park community and now part of the new community who are coming in and occupying the new buildings and it's really quite incredible we have a very strong 
neighborhood. Regent Park Society is a social development plan which uh, embraces uh, large, uh, really four pillars being safety, communications, um, um, community building, and um, I'm actually co-chair of the community building working group. Um, we're a group of people here comprised of residents, of agencies, and of other interested parties who are trying to make this an amazing community. And um, there are other neighborhood uh, groups in, similarly in other parts of the city. None of them have continued to meet and and mm -hmm. develop with the pandemic except for Regent Park. Wow, okay. Well, you guys have done a really incredible job, clearly. It's, it's really an ongoing there. process. <laughs> It's really lovely to see. It's really impressive. Yeah. Um, and so for Paintbox specifically, actually, how were you guys sort of impacted by the pandemic? You shut off your cafe completely. Is that what happened? So what happened is we were headed into our best year ever. We had more more catering booked than we ever have. It's uh, we had a better team than ever, um, a really amazing team. And in March, um, Within a matter of three days, we lost over a million dollars worth of bookings. Oh my gosh. Now, catering is a cyclical industry, so we tend, to, it's feast or famine, mm -hmm. but we tend to smooth out those, those kind of waves by doing a lot of preparation for the next positive wave. So January and February, we spent a lot of time making food, making, baking desserts and so on for the upcoming uh, busy season. And so it invested a lot in labor and in food in order to, to hit the ground running in March. Um, and then business evaporated. And I was left with a lot of food and a lot of debt, um, was forced to lay off the entire staff, and really was in an impossible situation because being our core being event catering, um, none of those large events are going to come back soon. Yeah. And so it was really pretty much a disaster, disastrous for paint box. Um, I was quite prepared to close the doors because I had no choice. I was deeply in debt and, and there was no foreseeable way out of it. We couldn't open on a limited basis because the cafe was never a profit center. It was always supported by the catering. So it was really, I was devastated. Um, it was really kind of an impossible situation. And so what made you decide to still keep Paintbox up and not close the doors permanently? A uh, happy con conflict of events. Um, I was introduced by my brother who works in, uh, who runs a, a tech incubator in Kitchener Waterloo uh -huh. to one of his former clients who's now a very close friend of his, um, Ali Aseria, who founded Well.ca, which he sold about three years ago, but um, he was a, a big time innovator in retail online. And uh, so Ali and his brother Jamil decided that they were going to start an online grocery store. Oh, wow. And called me in to support that. So um, it was days before I wasn't able, I wasn't going to be able to make the, my rent and I was going to be forced into closure. And uh, we came to an arrangement that they would start nibbly.ca wow. here at Paintbox. And myself and my colleague Allison were to to run it. Wow. So all of a sudden we were able to pay rent, but we had to turn our restaurant and catering company into a warehouse right. for online groceries. And is that so? Currently, your cafe space is occupied by a bit more of an office space right now. And is that what's going on in there? That's what's going on in there. Um, within a couple of weeks, it won't be an office space anymore. We will re reopen the cafe space. Um, but it won't look like it did before because quite simply what we did before was supported by the catering operation. Right. Did you require like rent support from the government? I know they had some sort of program going out. So the rent support program, which is an amazing program, um, really they didn't figure it out for several months after the pandemic hit. Right. Which meant um, operators like me had no idea whether it would be a thing that we would be eligible for or not. And being, not having the cash, um, literally we would have had to close before that support became available. And the, the other thing is the support is, is at the discretion of the landlord. Right. And not the tenant. So 
we also didn't know whether our landlord would be supportive of that program. It turned out they were. Well, that's good. And that's very good. Yeah. Uh, basically means that we pay 25% rent for the period of the program. Right. And so that, that was a big help. We also got a big help through the uh, Canadian Emergency Wage Support Program, which covered uh, a large amount of the cost of wages based on the pandemic. And we've also taken advantage of that. Um, without these programs, we literally would not be here. So it's, we've been really the beneficiary of them. Yeah. It's really inspiring and really wonderful. I'm really you know, glad that those programs ev eventually were put into place and mm -hmm. that it all, it all has smoothed over at least a little bit for now. Yeah, somewhat. It somewhat. was the, the wage supplement program, it was, it was kind of unfortunate that they didn't figure it out earlier. Yeah. And the reason it's, that's unfortunate is I could have made different moves that would have given me a lot more support. For example, um, my team was paid all of their outstanding vacation pay several weeks in advance of being laid off. Right. Which could have been partially covered by that program, but was not because I was proactive in doing that. And the other thing is, unlike most employers, I actually did um, provide statutory um, severance pay for them, wow. discrimination That's pay. Um, and it turned out I wouldn't have had to do that, actually. Oh. So, but at the end of the day, I feel extremely lucky um, and definitely have taken advantage of those supports. Yeah, that's incredible. I'm glad that they're there now, at least. Well, not really. all businesses get them. Yeah. You know, so it's it's been really good. Yeah. And it's really responsible of you to do that for your employees as well. I think that's a really incredible move on your part as well. Well, we are a B corporation. I don't know if you know what that is. No, um, I don't. We're actually. part of a community of businesses worldwide who are using the power of business to implement positive change. Right. So we're trying to, through the power of business, um, solve the climate crisis and poverty and these are the reason we're doing this is that these are areas that governments and nonprofits have traditionally supported but there's not they're not it's not possible for business for nonprofits and governments to realize these outcomes right. and really the power of business needs to be there to do it and it's a new kind of capitalism yeah. and so we are a, a company who um, is using business as a force for good. That's incredible to hear that really genuinely as somebody who's an active supporter of, you know, climate change and trying to you know, make a difference in my youth, obviously, it's really incredible to hear that that's expanding upwards through businesses as well. Obviously, I'm not in a position to do much right now, but I go to my protests, I post my information, I do my best. So it's really lovely to speak with you and hear all this. Well, I spent uh, part of the day today in a a meeting with about a hundred other CEOs of B Corps. Right. Um, in the middle of all this, just taking taking the time to spend time together and strategize as a group what we could do. And my colleague Allison, who you might or might not have met, was one of the speakers. I was wondering, like, when did you get into the arts and photography as well? Um, I got into photography because, as a chef, I wanted to shoot my food. Right. And I had, you know, setups like because I was a restaurant chef for, for years, mm -hmm. I'd have, you know, a setup on what they call the pass where the food is passed to the servers, right. um, where if I really liked a plate, I would take a shot of it. And I was always really into into playing into, you know, not serving the same presentation for every dish and so on. And so this this was fun for me. And then I realized that the pictures were pretty crappy and and so started learning about photography and started getting better equipment and started using natural light and, and graduated into using speed lights, but, but still do a lot of photography under natural light. Um, and eventually what happened is I started getting um, particularly magazines, um, but other, par other parties that wanted their own pictures to, for me to photograph their food because food photography at the time was, was viewed as a very difficult thing and not everybody kind of got it. And um, so I started actually selling my services to do food photography. And that, that graduated into, I had a brother who, I have a brother-in-law who's, who was working as an extra at the time. At this point, he's an actor, he's an actual actor, um, but he wanted headshots for him and his friends. And so I started learning how to do headshots. And I realized at that point, I just, that when you get a 
pair of eyes in a picture, it changes everything. Yeah. And also the rela relationship between the photographer and the subject is a, it's a really kind of special one. It's, it's kind of intimate on a certain level. And, uh, and I really enjoyed it, the one-on-one -on -one with, with the subject. And uh, I found myself eventually working in, uh, in Rosedale uh, at Summer Hill Market. I, I, became, I was chef and then I became vice president there. So in grocery, but in catering as well. And I ended up meeting a lot of people who became aware of my photography and became popular to have me do photography of families oh, wow. in Rosedale. Oh, actually, even got down to uh, photographing people's pets, which <laughs> wasn't my favorite, but was very much in demand. Um, so and so through that, I, got, I really got an interest in portraiture. And so most of my photography has been food or portraiture. Um, I've been, it's now a hobby. I don't do commercial work anymore. Right. Um, and so I, it depends on my whim, but you'll see inside the restaurant, uh, a, a lot of uh, photos from my last exhibition, which were all pictures of destruction of buildings in Regent Park. Oh, wow. And uh, these days I tend to just carry one lens and and be on kind of a mission for weeks or months with that then switch lenses and and my current thing is actually taking kind of atmospheric portraits of flowers <laughs> and things like that where you know it's very shallow depth of field with a, a macro lens and, and everything is blurred like crazy except for the actual thing that I've zeroed in on um, but, but that switches at this point it's just a fun thing although I do all the the work for paint box as well. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's so incredible. And so you also mentioned the demolition of Regent Park and stuff. So has was paint box here throughout some of the demolition, or was it like after stuff was being? Uh, we were in phase two of right. of the revitalization. Okay. Um, there's a total of uh, five phases. Right. The the buildings you see being built right now are part of phase three. So when I in, committed to doing paint box, this building wasn't here. It right. had been the underground park, it got to the point where the underground parking was built and the floor slab was laid. Right. Um, so yeah, it's changed a lot. Yeah, so it's changed since then, okay. Yeah, that building was not here. That building was here. That building was here, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. That's So from the ground up, you basically kind of, paint box was here with this building. Yes. Amazing, wow, okay. So was opening like a restaurant cafe type thing, has this been like a long time dream of yours or? No, I've opened a lot of restaurants. Right. Um, but it had been a long time since I opened a restaurant. Right, okay. Because I took the side, I, I basically took a sidebar into corporate chef work. I was corporate chef for Liberty Group. Right, um, yes. I did some work in hotels. I was actually executive chef at the largest hotel in the country. Wow. Um, and then I went into grocery and um, and from that into um, retail merchandising in general, um, I, I opened Evergreen Garden Market, the Brickworks, for example. Right. Oh. Right. And so it had been years since I'd done a restaurant, and it wasn't it wasn't my favorite thing to do in food, but it was in order to animate this corner, yeah. and really, as I mentioned before, was was being supported by catering, which I enjoy a lot more. In all the um, sort of pivoting and changing throughout the pandemic, have, has Paintbox been able to keep up with their sort of social impact and initiatives that you guys like focus on here? Definitely, on a number of levels. Um, we are um, working with uh, an amazing group of people um, who you will actually see in Paintbox right now preparing uh, what's called uh, Summer Lunch Plus. And Summer Lunch Plus is, a, is an initiative to uh, distribute food to families in need, but it's very cool. It's the food is distributed as a, a recipe box, uh -huh. so it's kind of like Hello Fresh, but it's for kids. So tomorrow, um, eighty-seven families from Regent Park and Moss Park will be here picking up a food bag that goes with recipes that the kids will prepare for their family meal, and it's an entire meal for six people. That's so that's pretty so cool. Um, effective next, we've done a lot of work with uh, the Region Park Catering Collective, which is located exactly at Kitty Corner to us. Oh. Um, but uh, we've done training with them in the paint box facility for ever since we opened. And uh, we're collaborating with them starting next week 
to prepare 50 meals a day for the seniors' residents, which is that one with the stacks on top. Um, uh, my colleague Allison has actually uh, started a GoFundMe, which is is providing um, food boxes also to uh, members of the Black community, and uh, these are being distributed in conjunction with Lyft. Right. Lyft has offered um, to bring people here to pick up their food. Oh, it's wonderful! Um, and yeah, so we're. And those are only a few of the initiatives. Right. So we're very, very committed to our social mandate. And uh, we've, since, since opening Nibley, we've actually hired four Regent Park, four more Regent Park residents living in Toronto Community Housing. Yeah. And so it's, yeah, it's, it's still a big part of our focus. That's incredible. nibbly.ca so you can buy everything from a uh, deodorant to oh, wow okay a cereal to uh, fish or meat oh incredible it's, okay yeah we have at this point around four thousand products wow okay that's incredible and we're same day delivery our particular focus is actually um that whole local farmer's market kind of focus right um to that end we're adding more um, products every day and more uh, bios and and links to uh to producers um i'm really lucky i'm working with somebody who shares my passion for local food uh, who's been it's only been with us for about two weeks but is amazing and uh, coming up with all these great connections and stories some, some of which were there before so We've always attracted food artisans. We have a uh, what we call our food business incubator program, which is the basis Nibley came in on. And so we've actually supported a lot of startup food businesses and also the attention of some amazing businesses. Um, one that my colleague Lucy just wrote up today is Good Food for Good. Wow, oh, okay. Good Food for Good is uh, the creation of one of our friends, Rosha, who came up to start with with uh, ketchup with oh. no sugar in it oh. the most delicious ketchup and the most special thing about her is that for every jar of product she sells she's subsequently expanded into barbecue sauces and curry bases and so on but for every jar you buy it uh, provides one meal to a person in need uh, similarly one of the other uh, uh, startup B Corps in the in in the, what at the time was a very small community in Canada, um, but at about the same time was uh, an organization of a business called Tiffin Day. Right. And it was started by my friend Seema, who wanted to, uh, with her environmental focus, deliver lunches to offices in Tiffins. Wow. Tiffins are basically lunch boxes from India. And so she would pick up the Tiffins when she did the next delivery and reuse them. Oh, wow. Um, okay. She, at this point, doesn't do Tiffin catering, but has come up with a line of um, sauces and soups. Okay, um, wow. Which you can buy in the likes of Whole Foods. And so we've been making contact over the years with lots of great artisans. And you'll see over the course of the development of the Nibbly website, much more on this, and it'll become much more of our focus because we've got to compete with large and in many cases, evil companies yeah. that can beat us in every other way. So our focus is going to be the, the local, the artisanal, the, uh, we're coming up with a very strong vegan content. Oh, wonderful, okay. And, that's um, so Nibley's gonna set, we're gonna set ourselves apart and differentiate ourselves by our strong local focus. Right, so local, vegan, environmentally friendly type exactly. of deal. Pandemic safe as well, it's online, so that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So do you think you could tell me a little bit more about sort of the date of the reopening and when the people of Regent Park can come? Well, we're reopening gradually. We've had right. uh, the ice cream window open now for about a month. Ooh. And it, as you can see, almost always has a lineup. Yeah. Um, we will be on about, well, we're shooting for the 24th of August. We will again be offering um, food and beverages. Um, but for takeout or to sit on the patio, um, we're still very reluctant to have a lot of people in, in the inside space for the time being. 
um, but will gradually morph into much more of a normal service. So you can come for your cappuccino and your sandwich um, on the 24th of August. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me, Chris. This was RPTV News. I'm Ella Cachamilia. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you, Ella. Please do not forget to like, comment, and share to our channel. Follow us on all our social media platforms. And for more information, please check out our website.